I think we'll get started here. I'm Mark Martin. I'm the Executive Director of Alberta's Industrial Heartland Association. I'm joined uh, here with Sean McCoy. He's an Assistant Professor in the Department of Chemical and Petroleum Engineering at the, Univers in, at the University of Calgary. I'll introduce uh, Dr. McCoy in more detail in a minute. I just want to um, make a few opening comments uh, about this uh, webinar here, a life cycle view of blue hydrogen production. A uh, very interesting and relevant topic for, uh, for certainly for us at the Industrial Heartland and hopefully for everybody here on the call. Um, but I'll make a few opening comments here and then um, I'll turn it over to Dr. McCoy to give a presentation and then we'll follow that up with, with some Q&A. So I would ask that you put any questions that you have into the Q&A section and then we'll um, we'll look at those as we as we uh, get near uh, the latter stages of the of the webinar. We have one hour here, a one hour session, so this will end at uh, two p.m. And uh, certainly want to thank all of you for your time for joining us, and and like to thank uh, Dr. McCoy as well for this his presentation. So, a um, couple of things just to start about um, about uh, blue hydrogen and, and hydrogen production. So. You know, at Alberta's Industrial Heartland Association, what we're involved in is we are, first of all, our association represents municipalities. We represent the, the city of Fort Saskatchewan, city of Edmonton, and Strathcona, Sturgeon, and Lamont counties. And, and, and uh, we are focused on economic development of Alberta's Industrial Heartland, which is in the northeast corner of the Edmonton metropolitan region. We also have three associate members, towns of Gibbons, Redwater and Bruderheim, but we're focused on attracting large scale value add energy investments to this region. We spend a fair amount of time traveling the world, talking to companies to help them figure out if it makes sense for their next capital investment for it to be in the industrial heartland. And when we're talking to investors and we talk about the value proposition here in Alberta, we, we you know, of course reference the low cost feedstock that is available here some of the lowest cost feedstocks in North America and the world. But we also highlight the infrastructure that's here. Not only the connectivity that we have with the two class one railways and the road networks and the other uh, electrical and pipeline networks that are here, but also very importantly now, the, um, the development of carbon capture utilization and storage capability and infrastructure that's here. And that of course leads to the opportunity for uh, the production of low carbon uh, hydrogen and, and uh, Dr. McCoy will get into uh, the carbon intensities associated with this, but what it does here is it positions this region to be able to produce low cost, low carbon hydrogen that can then help companies meet their environmental objectives. And if that's to produce low carbon products for the world, that's certainly something that can be done here in the industrial heartland basically again, as a result of that carbon capture utilization storage capability that has been developed uh, over the last number of years here in this region and the opportunity for additional CCUS capability going forward. Now, globally, when we're talking to companies, there's, there's often conversations around green production of hydrogen versus blue production. What all that means, we like to try to focus the conversation around carbon intensity and be less focused on the different colors, blue versus green, I think, conversations around the carbon intensity and what that actually means will be more relevant for everybody going forward as the world starts to get a better understanding of, of what carbon intensities and the capabilities and the different levels of production that happen for hydrogen. And so this is what makes this webinar, I think, very relevant today. And I'm really excited to have this conversation here today with, with Sean McCoy, because we're going to be talking specifically about the production of blue hydrogen and the carbon intensity associated with that. And uh, we're looking forward to the, the, I'm looking forward to the conversation and really looking forward to some questions uh, from, from the uh, participants here today. So with that, I am going to introduce Sean McCoy, as I said before, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical and Petroleum Engineering at the University of Calgary. He's been there since 2018. His team focuses on the assessment of greenhouse gas emissions reduction technologies and carbon dioxide removal technologies. His current projects include life cycle assessment and techno-economic assessment of direct air capture, carbon dioxide conversion technologies, and low emission hydrogen, analysis of potential technology futures, and exploration of policy mechanisms to incentivize emissions reductions 
and CDR. Uh, Sean earned a PhD in engineering and public policy from Carnegie Mellon University in 2008 and a Bachelor of Applied Science from the University of Waterloo in environmental engineering with a chemical specialization in 2003. Dr. McCoy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Mark. I'm really glad to be here today. And, you know, I have to say I'm even um, more excited in some way to hear that, uh, that you say that CCS infrastructure is a selling point. So I, I've been working on, on CCS for 20 years and, and the story for, for most of that time was, uh, this is just a pain in the rear end, but uh, it's great to hear that people want, might want to just come to Alberta because of it. So that's super. And I think that's, uh, that's a great sign. And so today, um, as Mark alluded to, I'm here to try to give a, a really kind of 10,000 foot overview of uh, the life cycle for blue hydrogen production. And as Mark said, it's really important because, you know, I think as I'll be talking about through this, we see, you know, the reason we're talking about blue hydrogen is to get us to a net zero future. And uh, that's a big part of, of, the, of the drive, I think, uh, at least federally uh, and in other countries to do this. So we'll get started. Um, I look forward to the Q&A at the end, so I hope you'll, you'll be punching in your questions there. So, you know, we're really witnessing a hydrogen renaissance if you didn't know this already, right? Uh, what I'm showing you here are covers uh, from national or subnational uh, government reports that try to set concrete targets or uh, uh, actions that governments uh, uh, have announced to drive production, use, or integration of hydrogen into their energy systems, right? So this is far from exhaustive. I'm sure you're all looking and going, oh, I saw one from a different country, but um, there's a lot of them. And not even not all of them are final, right? And others are in development. And you know, I think the really interesting thing that we need to keep in mind is this isn't the first time we've been here, right? So uh, if we went all the way back to Jules Verne. Uh, it was pointed out by Alan Finkel, who, uh, Dr. Alan Finkel, who's a former chief scientist in Australia, that uh, Jules Verne wrote uh, that uh, we we're going to have a future which will, where water will one day be employed as a fuel, that hydrogen, and oxygen, which uh, constitute it, used singly or together, will furnish an inexhaustible source of heat and light, right? So we've been thinking about this for a long time. That was science fiction. But then more recently, right back in uh, 2003, uh, I uh, remember hearing George Bush say um, you know, they're making a national commitment that, uh, that the scientists and engineers will overcome obstacles to taking uh, hydrogen fuel cell cars from laboratory to showroom so that the first car driven by a child born today could be powered by hydrogen and pollution free. And so that, uh, for those of you who remember, led into the Freedom Car Initiative at DOE way back uh, in 2003 or 2005. So the thing though, right, is that this time the drivers are different. This isn't science fiction, and this isn't just about um, sort of energy security or a concern that we might run out of fossil fuels. And what's really driving our uh, desire to look at hydrogen today is because we're running out of space in the atmosphere, right? That we have a climate problem. And that climate problem is, is being manifest through, our, uh, uh, through you know, the global warming we observe and the climate effects that come with it. And we've committed uh, nationally anyway, and most countries of the world um, have committed to trying to hit a target, right? They've committed to trying to keep this climate change as manifest by temperatures to uh, one and a half degrees Celsius. And what we know over time is that we've been emitting carbon dioxide, right? We have a very good accounting of that carbon dioxide here. I'm showing that in this, uh, in this orange line. It's been going up over time, right? And that's uh, clear. Anyone who's read work by Vakov Smil or, or other great uh, thinkers like this know that there's a really strong correlation between energy and development. And as the world's been developing, we've been using more energy and that energy has been fossil uh, based largely. So we've seen that go up and if we just continued a trajectory, a trend line into the future, we would be emitting roughly this year, and, and COVID was a blip here, but 36 billion tons a year of carbon dioxide from fossil fuels in industry, and that's growing actually. At, that rate is increasing at uh, 0.6 gigatons per year. So the amount we're emitting is going up, the rate we're emitting is going up. And uh, the, uh, we see that if we have a carbon budget, and what we mean by a carbon budget is that is we, we have a very good, climate scientists that is, have made a very strong, drawn a very strong correlation between the amount of carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere and the temperature rise we're going to see. And this, uh, as we emit carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, our carbon budget is thus decreasing, right? We're eating into this budget. And there's some uncertainty around that. But today, we figure we have 500 billion tons of emissions remaining, right? And we're emitting at 
close to 40 billion tons a year. So at some point in the not so distant future, whether or not uh, we like it, we're going to run out of this carbon budget. And that's the idea, or the, the reasoning, reasoning and rationale between hitting net zero, right? That we don't want to, we want to hit some target. Maybe we can't do one and a half, but we want to stabilize temperature somehow. And that means we eventually have to get to net zero. And you know, this means that we, we see these net zero targets as a forcing function for hydrogen, right? It's not just a transport story as in the past. We see industrial applications across all kinds of different uh, sectors. Um, and we see this happening because, uh, because hydrogen is a net zero energy carrier, right? A net zero fuel. And I'll use fuel and energy carrier interchangeably here, but when we, we have H2, when we burn it, we get H2O, we have no carbon involved. And, and we, we're not worried about the, uh, the, the climate uh, impacts of burning or oxidizing using that hydrogen, right? And we see over time that it's, it's uh, the initial uses are about converting existing fossil fuel uses over to, um, uh, to hydrogen. But later this starts to become about new uses like more into transportation, for example. And we see in these sort of IEA scenarios as in the IEA net zero scenario that there's a mix, right? From electrolysis and from fossil fuels. And indeed, we see that in Canada, right? Canada has its grand plans for hydrogen. Uh, we see the roadmap coming out, right? Four uh, million tons of hydrogen per year in 2030 to 20 and 2050 is, is in our CAN's uh, goal from 2021. Uh, and this is not just for use inside uh, Canada to transform our energy system and our industrial manufacturing system, but also uh, to export, right? And Alberta as a province is really strongly looking at that. And I'm sure Mark spends a lot of time thinking about this, right? Is how are we gonna get this hydrogen out? And can we make it? Who wants it? How much are they gonna pay for it, right? And so this, this grand plan for hydrogen really is all hinging on this idea that we need to get to net zero. So I think the question for everyone here, and you can just, uh, if we we're in a classroom, we'd put up a show of hands. And if I was uh, ahead of it, I'd put a poll together. But here's the question. Is hydrogen a net zero energy carrier? What do you think? I can imagine three different answers here, right? One is, yeah, of course. I just said, you just said it emits only water. No, it's not, right? It's production generates many environmental impacts, including emissions. That's another alternative view. And uh, the, the, the real view and the one that I think people don't like to hear as much is it depends, right? And we're gonna talk about on the factors on which it depends today in the rest of this talk. So I wanna leave you though with three key points um, that I'm gonna come back to. And I'm gonna show you uh, why these are key points as we go through the talk. So as I said, hydrogen is really only gonna be beneficial if it helps us hit our net zero targets, right? And that means it has to have lower emissions across its life cycle than the alternatives we might be using. Those alternatives could be hydrogen from a different source. It could be electricity, right? Electricity and hydrogen can compete. They can complement too, but that's another energy carrier. And so we look at this, we need to have high overall CO2 capture rates. That's the first point. We need to have methane emissions that are measured and controlled in the upstream, regardless of whether we look at what we'll talk about a moment, global warming, 100 year or 20 year global warming potential. And I'll expand on that in a minute. Sorry for dropping acronyms on you. And then the third point is that there's an opportunity here for Alberta to demonstrate that we can generate low, very low greenhouse gas uh, intensity hydrogen through certification of our supply chains. So let's get into this uh, a little bit more here. So. As I think everyone knows, and Mark alluded to, right? When you're going around the world, people have different views on how you're gonna make hydrogen. Well, in Alberta, we make a lot of hydrogen today, right? Uh, I think it's something like 5,000 tons of gray hydrogen produced in Alberta today. Uh, Mark's probably got better numbers, but um, we have that and we can expand on it. Where does that hydrogen get used? That hydrogen is being used in largely refining, but some fertilizers, right? And some other uses probably. But that's largely coming from uh, the uh, steam methane reforming of natural gas, a fossil fuel. When we look at hydrogen in our net zero world, um, we are uh, thinking about using blue hydrogen, right? Which is basically gray hydrogen where we add CCS and capture those emissions and green hydrogen, another option uh, where we use renewables and nuclear, right? And that's gonna go into many different uses that we don't have today. But the thing which drives me nuts is that we see a new flavor every month. Someone just told me, for example, that natural gas pyrolysis is turquoise. And then I heard that nuclear-based hydrogen is pink. Who knew? I'm not sure what color SMR hydrogen will be. Maybe invisible, I'm not sure. That's a joke, by the way. 
Um, so, so I, you know, I, I think we need to be thinking very carefully here about coming, instead of coming up with these labels, we need to focus on what matters to our net zero journey. That's greenhouse gas emissions intensity. And this isn't hard because we already have a framework, an established framework, I teach classes on it here at the university to do life cycle assessment. And that quantifies the, the environmental impacts of providing goods and services. So I'll say a bit more about that, right? That's life cycle assessment, LCA, as you'll hear it commonly referred to, is typically thought of as a decision-making tool Right, to identify environmental burdens and environmental impacts of providing a product process or service over the life cycle, which is to say from cradle to grave. Right, So this is all the way from extraction materials from the environment, because everything we have around us begins with some extractive process, all the way through to use and final disposal of whatever waste there might be. Right? And we think about it in this whole circular uh, way from, again, cradle to grave, because we want to make good decisions. Why? And that's why it's a decision making tool. But as many of you will know, it is being used increasingly as well as a regulatory tool. Right. So we see uh, in California, one of the first places that did this, the low carbon fuel standard, which some of you will be familiar with, which basically sets a target for a declining uh, uh, carbon intensity. Uh, of the fuel supply in California for transport. We see this being used here in Canada, right? With the emerging fuel standards that we have, right? That are being developed now. And so it's not just a decision-making tool, it's being expanded to actual applications and, and regulation. So it makes it very, very important, I think. So let's zoom in for a sec on what the cradle of grave life cycle might look like for blue hydrogen. Um, and so when we look at this again, it's cradle to grave. It's going to be the whole life cycle. So that means we're starting with natural gas extraction. And, and you'll see I use blue hydrogen shorthand through here, but we're going to come back to, to talking about carbon intensity in a minute. So uh, I have to slot myself every time I say that, but let's focus on carbon intensity, but I'm still going to use a shorthand. We see natural gas extraction is where we get that gas out of the ground. We process it, right? We sweeten, um, we compress it up so we can get it through transmission pipelines. And then finally, we hit what we talk about a lot and we think about a lot, which is hydrogen production. Once we do that higher production, we have to distribute and use that hydrogen. And on the back end, we are going to transport carbon dioxide and store carbon dioxide right, through the CCS process. And so when we do a life cycle assessment of this chain, we're looking to quantify environmental impacts. And specifically, right, we, there's lots of environmental impacts that come from all of this, right? We all can imagine some, but we're in this case really looking at uh, those that cause global warming, right, directly. So that's global warming potential, that's emissions of greenhouse gases across the entire chain, across all of these parts. Now, the thing that I think a lot of us think about all the time is hydrogen production. So let's really zoom in for a sec and talk about hydrogen production. Let's understand what the options are there, right? Commercially, as, as we saw in our color rainbow, there's many options that are more and less commercial, but let's just look at those that I think are primary interest here in Alberta. So we know we do steam methane reforming here already. And so hopefully you can see my pointer here. We've got steam methane reforming. Right? And in this process, we're going to take natural gas. We have to do a little bit of pre-reforming for heavier hydrocarbons. And we run it through a steam methane reforming furnace. So this is, as many of you know, a lot of tubes bundled up into a furnace where you're uh, uh, very high temperature, radiant heat transfer. You're gonna cause this gas when mixed with, uh, this natural gas when mixed with steam to become a mixture of carbon monoxide, uh, carbon dioxide and some hydrogen. And we run it through something called a water gas shift, which gets us more hydrogen and uh, creates some more CO2 in the process carbon dioxide. When we add capture to this, what, what we call partial capture to this facility, we're gonna strip the carbon dioxide out and we're gonna take that away and send it off to storage. And we're gonna take some, whatever's left over, the tail gas, run it back through our PSA, get out the hydrogen we want and uh, whatever goes uh, left goes into the furnace as fuel. We can also think about an SMR with total capture. Okay, and that SMR total capture, because we take some of the tail gas back to the furnace, which contains carbon dioxide in this situation, we want to do capture off the, the, uh, the furnace flue gas. And this allows us not to get just the CO2 out of the reforming process, but also out of the furnace. And then finally, we have autothermal reforming with capture. And this is a slightly different process, right? We're going to do partial oxidization and steam methane reforming together in one furnace, but because we're burning, we're partially oxidizing some of the gas uh, fuel, uh, feedstock, excuse me, to this furnace, we can uh, produce the heat we need internally. 
So we don't have this external furnace. So in some sense, the CO2 capture off this process is a little bit simpler. There's one place you'd usually put it, and that's here after a water gas shift and before sort of a final cleanup of hydrogen. Now, what this means, because SMR has uh, this external furnace, that if we only do partial capture of an SMR, we might only get, say, two thirds of the carbon dioxide out of this plant. And this is roughly what Quest is doing in Edmonton, uh, in, in the Fort Saskatchewan area, right, at the Scotford Refinery. Uh, and so this is a sort of a partial capture process. The next step up would be to go to total capture on SMR, and we could get maybe 90%, probably higher than that, but 90 to 93% probably capture if we, if we vary the capture efficiency a bit, capture efficiency being how effective is this carbon capture unit at removing CO2, but probably 90%. Then autothermal reforming has, again, a bit of a range, but we can easily get up to 93% with an autothermal reforming system. We can't get all of the carbon dioxide because we do have some cogen and fire heating typically outside. And so you can see other people, like there's proposals for plants in Alberta, which would, for example, burn hydrogen here, so we don't have to emit carbon dioxide. But if you just think about the simplest case, that's sort of a 93% capture rate at the high end. So different plant choices and design are going to give us different rates. So that's one part of the life cycle, right? We're going to have emissions there. Another thing that, I, that should be mentioned as well is that we have these plants in SMR today, for those of you who are familiar with it, is a big exporter of electricity. It in fact, might generate, uh, I can't remember the exact size of this, but tens of megawatts of electricity. We typically consume some, we would maybe compress some of that hydrogen, and we'd have a lot left for export or some left for export. If we move to total capture, we're changing the energy balance. And that means that we're actually going to have to import electricity or have some kind of cogen uh, operation um, to provide electricity to uh, run capture and compression. And so uh, that means that basically we have less steam. We have electricity to play with when we add SMR with capture. And it's really interesting because it's even more of an issue for an ATR because the ATR is more efficient. It doesn't have to waste as much energy in the form of heat to get the hydrogen. And therefore we have less opportunity to generate electricity off an ATR traditionally. So uh, there's some trade-offs here as well and in interplay with electricity systems that come into that life cycle. And I didn't show that explicitly in the diagram, but something to consider, particularly in Alberta where today we, and for the near future, we have a relatively high carbon intensity grid. So we've talked about hydrogen production. Let's step back and think about where this gas is coming from, right? Because that's part of the life cycle too. So we've got extraction, processing, transport. Let's zoom in there for a sec. If we look at this, this figure I borrowed from a recent paper, I'll say more about this paper in particular a little later. Um, we have sort of pre-production activities, drilling and completion of wells. Once we get producing, right? We have uh, normal activities, uh, workovers of wells, uploading. Processing, we go through acid gas removal, uh, dehydration, compression, so we eventually get to transport, and we finally hit our hydrogen plant as the end use in this case. And uh, when we think about this, we know we have energy consumption across the chain. So we emit carbon dioxide, right? We burn uh, natural gas, we burn our, our fuel we're transporting in compressor stations all the time. No problem, we burn it, CO2 is emitted, uh, we can account for that, and we have good numbers on it. The challenges, though, are the, the VFF promotes venting, flaring, and fugitives, right? So we know across the life cycle, we have lots of places, all the way from the things that everyone knows about, like pneumatic uh, uh, valves that would, in operation, vent methane, and that's an easy thing that people are working to replace, uh, to more challenging things like episodic kind of um, liftoffs of safety valves and, and sort of things that happen, but we don't, we can only see them because if we just come and take a, take a, do a site survey, um, we might not see that episodic emission, right? And so I'll say more about that in a minute, but it turns out those sort of episodic emissions are a very big deal in, uh, in, in the upstream footprint of natural gas production. But the challenge is that these emissions are actually really poorly constrained. So I'll give you an example here, and I'm not trying to pick here on Canada because the same could be said or even worse of other regions of the world. But uh, this study, the figure I'm showing from Chanadal here, is showing um, estimated methane emissions based on um, monitoring, remote sensing, if I recall correctly, of methane emissions across Alberta and Saskatchewan in the red bar. And they attribute most of these emissions to energy. They think that the egg and waste emissions are pretty well understood, but they, in any case, that 
Whether that's true or not, I'm not sure, but they attribute this largely to energy, so oil and gas production, perhaps coal as well, but that's relatively small. And then we know we have uh, what's reported in our national inventory report in the um, blue uh, line for energy. And what this is showing you is that we're basically chronically underestimating in our national inventory report the amount of methane that's emitted from oil and gas in the atmosphere. We're not the only people doing this. The similar, actually almost the same number, 60%, is sort of the number that's been toyed with in the United States for the underreporting of emissions uh, from their uh, national inventory report. So this is a problem because it means that the gas we produce here in Alberta is um, resulting in more emissions, more climate change, right, than we think. And, um, you know, there are a lot of factors, as I mentioned, that, that are contributing to this, this ability, this inability to really well, well constrain this leakage rate or this venting flaring fugitive uh, emissions. And that's variability, right, both in space and time. We have a real lack of geographically um, representative field data, right? We have studies that are from the Permian or studies from uh, places in the North Sea or a little bit here in Alberta, but we need to have more studies to really understand statistically what's going on here. We have a lack of consistent reporting metrics, right? Are you reporting emissions, for example, on the gas production, gross volumes or net volumes that are going to market? It really simply, and system boundaries, right? This uh, study is showing this is all energy. So oil and gas, how do we allocate that? How do we attribute that just to gas? So challenges, lots of challenges remain in this area and work's going on. There's work going on here. I'll talk more about in a minute in Alberta that my colleagues are doing. So how do we compare the climate impacts of different greenhouse gases, right? Because what I did say too, is that we're emitting both um, carbon dioxide and methane, right? And we always see emissions reported in CO2, carbon dioxide E equivalent. And that equivalence allows us to take emissions, there's a factor, a conversion factor, that's gonna allow us to add up emissions of different substances which all have different lifetimes in the atmosphere and abilities to absorb um, radiation and re-emit it and cause warming, okay, or what's known as radiative forcing. Um, we have these factors, GWP, that allow us to convert from one to the other. So you may be well aware, or you may not, that if you emit one kilogram of methane to the atmosphere, that's the same as when all these blocks stop counting. Almost there. So 30 kilograms of CO2 in its equivalent global warming impact as measured over a hundred year period. This is known as GWP 100. So I'll show that later, but you'll probably heard this talked about today. What's even worse is that if we measure its global warming impact over 20 years, it's 83 times as uh, potent as carbon dioxide when it's emitted. So you can imagine that the emissions from this upstream are really, when we measure them in carbon dioxide equivalents, which is the functional, or the, the uh, excuse me, not the functional, but the, 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 um, the impact metric that we're using usually in life cycle assessments and assessments of carbon intensity of hydrogen, that we really have a big multiplier effect, right? Uh, of that, those small emissions from the upstream on the end result. And so this is really, and why would people use the 20 year number, right? Why don't we just all use 100? Well, 100 is typically what gets used in, in IPCC reports and things, but we use 20 here because people are often concerned about hitting net zero in a, no, in a short time frame. So a lot of times this gets used. I think it's important to think about both, but uh, I'm not gonna advocate for one or the other, but it gets used. And it uses as a, as a cudgel, right, against um, hydrogen, blue hydrogen. And so when we, we've seen a lot of work that had come out, my colleagues and I, and we said, you know, this uh, work is, in our opinion, misrepresenting what's happening with um, life cycle assessment of hydrogen production chains. There's lots of issues here, as you can imagine, as I'm talking with different capture levels, different you know, fugitive emissions rates, but there's some work which was coming out and saying, hey, this blue hydrogen has no place in a net zero future. It doesn't make any sense. And we said, well, hang on. It does, but we need to understand the conditions under which it would make sense. And that's what we set out to do. So bear with me while I give you some information about the technical assumptions we made, then I'll get right into some um, results here and we'll spend a moment on those. So the scenarios we looked at were to, for the technical assumptions, we're gonna produce hydrogen at 200 bar, right? So 99.9% .9 hydrogen, that's quite high purity. Um, might need to be higher for some applications, but pretty decent. 
we are uh, importing electricity or we're getting credit when we export electricity to a grid using a European average, which is 420 kilograms CO2 per, per kilowatt hour, which is actually not terribly far off where Alberta will be or is uh, very soon. We're doing comparisons uh, with electrolyzers at 55 kilowatt hours per kilogram hydrogen. So this is a pretty efficient electrolyzer and it's um, compressed up to the same pressure. And we're doing CO2 separation using tried and true processes, MDEA. Lots of other ways we could do this, but we're using something which is commercially available today. And we look at two cases, a low capture case where we do what I referred to earlier as partial capture and a high case where we have a high rate of capture from an autothermal reforming plant. And so in the low case, it's sort of like 55% overall capture. Again, something like you might see for the Quest project at the high end, it's 93% capture. This is sort of consistent with some of the projects we've seen proposed here in Alberta and the industrial heartland. And so here's the results, busy. So let's just take a moment to look at them. Um, so what we're seeing here, we have two axes, right? One is kilogram CO2 equivalent. So this is the CO2E with the global warming factor used to make sure we can add everything up per megajoule of lower heating value hydrogen. And we've got the other side because people often think about kilograms per kilogram hydrogen. So same uh, measure, different functional unit down here, kilograms hydrogen. And we have it for different emissions rates, right? Because we said, we don't really know exactly what emissions rates are. They need to be better constrained. And we have numbers which are 8% uh, methane leakage, which are, have been measured in places like recently the Permian Basin, um, but also in, in, uh, in African oil field, uh, North African oil fields that supply Europe, or gas fields that supply Europe. We have a 1.5% emission rate, which is roughly what the Department of Energy says it is on average in the United States. And then we have uh, the 0.2% uh, emissions rate, which is the target for OGCI, the oil and gas climate initiative companies. And so we said, let's look at the range. We look at GWP 120, because people like to argue over it. And we look at no CCS, CCS low and CCS high, as I just described. So 55% capture overall and 93% capture overall. So if we just pick any emissions rate, let's take the 0.2%, we get CCS, uh, a steam methane reforming plant, is about nine or 10 kilograms CO2 equivalent uh, per kilogram hydrogen. That's where this number falls out. And the bulk of that is direct emissions from burning fuels in that furnace in the, in, in the plant and uh, uh, from the feedstock, the conversion process itself. The upstream is pretty small and the upstream big impact is carbon dioxide, not methane. If we add CCS, it's exactly like we think. A low case, we drop it down to maybe five, five between five and six kilograms per kilogram hydrogen. And um, we export a little bit of electricity, or I think we might import in this case, excuse me. And so it boosts the carbon intensity a little bit. And if we go to a high CCS case, this is this autothermal reforming case with a full capture, we really drop emissions down. So great news, right? And this is sort of in the ballpark of four, three to four, uh, if I recall correctly, kilograms uh, CO2 per kilogram hydrogen. If we then uh, take a look at higher emissions rates, we'll take the extreme 8%, what we're seeing is that the emissions upstream dominate. And basically there's no way to make hydrogen here that's gonna be competitive with what people are demanding uh, in emerging standards like certified things like that in Europe, right? Because these upstream emissions are just going to, to basically blow out our uh, carbon um, um, uh, emission sort of stack here. And so this highlights, right, that there's two things. We need to be thinking about high rates of capture, but also low rates of upstream emissions. If we take a look at this second result. This is the comparison with electrolysis, right? Because a lot of people uh, really view electrolysis as really the only sustainable way to make hydrogen. So we said, okay, at what point, if we have electrolysis using renewables, and we have a range here because renewables are not zero carbon on the life cycle, they're low but not zero, they might be between 10 and 50 uh, grams per kilowatt hour of emissions. And so we have a range depending where you get those renewables. And we can see that if we take our CCS high case, that's the solid line in blue uh, with varying methane emission reduction rates, we see that we have a crossover around 1%. So if we have that ATR with the highest level of, with an, well not the highest, but a 93% overall capture rate, and uh, we have 1% leakage, we're just as good as renewables could be. And um, if we had GWP 20, it drops to about 0.4% leakage. The 
Important point, however, today is that if you were to plug electrolysis, electrolyzers into the grid in the United States, and you were to look at the 100 year DWP at that 1.5% leakage rate or 1.4, something like that, you'd be having uh, emissions per kilogram of hydrogen, which are much, much higher than any of our cases with CCS, whether or not you're looking at 120 year. The same can be said for Europe, even though Europe has an overall average uh, grid intensity that's lower than the United States, it's still much higher than SMR with CCS. So what we can see here is that it's clear there are ways to get us blue hydrogen that in the long run would be just as good as renewables, right? And today it's much better than electrolysis with renewables. So what does all this mean? Again, let me wrap it back to the points I made. We need high overall capture rates if we're gonna produce hydrogen sustainably, and that's imperative, right? We need to control and, and measure upstream emissions of methane. And we need to make sure that we have information that's out there so that when you go to market with this hydrogen, people can be confident, right? That it's low, it really is low emitting, right? That it, it stands out. It's, it's about product differentiation if you will in the marketplace here. And I, and I want to leave you, this is an opportunity, I think, for Alberta, because there is work that's come out, how my colleague Drew Bergerson did this work, that suggests that those upstream gas emissions could be very low in Alberta. So just as an example, what I'm showing here is that the emissions intensity, the, the GWP, the, the carbon intensity of natural gas at the outline of a, outlet of a pipeline, a gram CO2 equivalent, so we're using that E again, this is, I believe, a 100-year GWP per megajoule of the pipeline outlet. And what they're showing is those upstream emissions, right? So we're not burning the gas here, we're just talking about what it costs us upstream to the point at which we put it into the hydrogen plant, right? And the US might be uh, with those sort of average numbers, not the extreme ranges, although they start to reflect some of them here with these whiskers, um, might be 15 grams per megajoule. But we have producers in Alberta who are paying attention to VFF um, that they're doing, um, and, and they are doing some enhanced measuring and monitoring, and they think that their emissions are much lower, maybe around five, three times lower, right? So if we think about competitive advantage here, if we can come, we can, you know, replicate this, right, in terms of reducing, preventing, flaring, fugitives, and measuring and getting that data out there, right, Alberta can be very, very competitive. Uh, and this is, these are rates which would get us uh, in competition with electrolytic hydrogen for a long time. So um, that leaves us with some challenges. So we'll, I'll leave you with that. And then I think we can get to the q and I hope. So we got to build hydrogen plants with high levels of CCS. Think about those electricity system interactions, although that's getting less and less of a problem as our grid intensity falls rapidly. We got to measure opportunity emissions and create confidence in what we report for our GHG intensities here for hydrogen. We have to drive emissions down on that upstream for faster than you're doing on the upstream for electrolytic hydrogen, right? So if our carbon intensity of the grid comes down, that benefits electric, electrolytic hydrogen. If we wanna be competitive with that, we gotta drive those upstream emissions down faster too. And we gotta do it all being cost competitive. And by the way, research that's coming out says hydrogen has a GWP too, and it's not zero, it's not, and it's not even one, it's greater than one. It's probably five or more based on some of the, some more, a few years ago, there's some stuff that said it was about five. There's some more recent stuff that says it might be higher. So we had to also think about downstream. And I didn't talk about the downstream today, where hydrogen is being used, where the emissions are happening when we put it into the pipe. But that's another piece. And there's a not lot out there at all on that. Uh, so with that, it's easy, right? Um, I'm going to leave it there. And uh, I would be happy to first make a couple of acknowledgements and then take questions. So Dala El Nagumi supplied some of the work that I show here. He's a former master's student. David Lazelle, who's probably listening today at the Transition Accelerator, gave some good pointers on this and support from the Canada First Research Excellence Fund through UC. So thank you. That's excellent. Thank you very much, Sean. Very interesting. So we, this is great. We have 20 minutes for some questions and, and discussion. So I'm, I'm going to kick it off here just selfishly from, from just from my understanding. So on the last couple of slides there, I think you were showing the, the methane impact in, in grams per megajoule from Alberta relative to the United States. So that number you said around five grams per megajoule. So that then corresponds, if you put that through an ATR with the high carbon capture, that then is, is more or has a 
lower carbon intensity than uh, hydrogen from renewables. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, I got to go back and, and verify that number because this is always the trick, right? We talked about leakage rates and I gave you an absolute number. I believe five would be would be uh, probably about 0.5 or 0.4. So it would certainly be around that, uh, around that threshold today. Yeah. And um, importantly, make it clear that that was for one company's case, right? So right. Okay. What we, the challenge is we don't know, we don't have enough good data across all of Alberta to know exactly what our supply chains for gas are doing. But that was one company's experience. Okay. That my colleague would have been. Yeah. And, that's, and that's certainly an opportunity for Alberta, as you've mentioned here, uh, to to develop or develop the certification process, the supply chains that really can put Alberta on the map in terms of low carbon intensity hydrogen production. So I think that's a great point. The other thing, just before I go to the Q&A, um, Sean was, and I know that <clears throat> Transition Accelerator and Dr. Lizell made this point before too, like when you're comparing to electricity, uh, hydrogen made from electricity, that, you know, there's a limit as to how much is practical from an electricity standpoint, right? If you wanna to transition to a hydrogen economy quickly and at scale, the role of natural gas, blue hydrogen or low carbon uh, hydrogen from natural gas is, is critical here because the actual amount of electricity that you can practically have in place to move quickly is, is gonna be a limitation. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so I think, yeah, it's actually very timely, this this uh, question, right? Because uh, last week, I believe it was, ASO came out with some net zero scenarios to the Alberta grid. If you look at those scenarios, they're talking about putting on, I can't remember which one I'm going to refer to here, but seven gigawatts of renewables that have to go onto the grid to hit net zero, right? And the CES, the Clean clean Energy stand, Electricity Standard, excuse me, that's coming on from the federal government is going to force us down a pathway here. So, whether or not we want to make a bunch of hydrogen in Alberta, we're already going to have to really expand our renewable production, right? And so what we have to ask ourselves a question, and I mean, different people are paying for this, right? The rate payers for Alberta, who, you know, uh, versus companies who might want to make hydrogen, I think there's a little difference here, but do we, if we're going to make a bunch of renewable electricity, ought, ought we be using it to decarbonize the grid to the most, the greatest extent we can, or should we be put into electrolytic hydrogen? And my argument would be, what I've just shown you, given that we have these opportunities to come with really low GHG intensity hydrogen today, I think we ought to focus on that. And like, let's work on the grid. We got to do that. But let's think about that hydrogen in, in uh, let's think about electricity uh, or the hydrogen from uh, uh, natural gas today. Natural gas, yeah. Great, great comments. Okay, we have a number of questions here. So I will um, throw them out to you here. Um, so one, there was a question around carbon intensities, uh, which you, I think you showed a slide. Um, and, and, and can you just comment actually on the carbon intensities, how that, how do these carbon intensities compare to this, you know, low carbon certifications that are being discussed in Europe and you mentioned certify and others. Yeah. Well, so that certify standard, I believe, and I'm sure there's other here who can chime in if I'm wrong, but I believe it's like 3.6 kilograms per kilogram yep. hydrogen or something like that, or grams, is it grams per megajoule? Anyway, the, the, point, the point, important difference in units there, but the, the point is that if we can do CCS on uh, at high levels on our production today, and we can, you know, even with average rates, we're pretty, we're pretty close to that and we can be under it, right? If we can get those upstream emissions down. So that, that shouldn't be, I think, a barrier to us, but that's sort of the number uh, we're talking about. And that's something like, I believe their target is a 60% reduction off an SMR doing green hydrogen today. That's what their, okay. their target would be. So we're well positioned there with, again, with recognizing that the methane slippage, et cetera, out of our, our upstream natural gas needs to be at a point where, but we're well positioned to meet some of that if we have, um, uh, I guess, in some case, reduction or at least some case certification of that natural gas to give us some numbers that can be credible on the global stage. Um, so going through these questions, would it be fair to think of electrolysis as a potential means of load balancing to deal? Oh, just wait. Sorry, I jumped into the middle of a question. My mistake. Um, going back to the relative intensity, is splitting hydrogen from bitumen a realistic option is a question. Yeah, so... Uh, I'll be careful. I know uh, the transaction accelerator has done some work on this. Um, you know, so I think it's an option, 
But what we're going to get into there is, is, is the CO2 becomes a problem, right? So when we think about doing uh, CCS on an SMR, we're talking about 10 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen that we're producing. So, you know, when that, that's a multiplier, any of the CCS that we're looking at in the hubs that are being developed, right? Whatever they end up charging kind of gets multiplied by a factor of 10 on the hydrogen price. If we look at doing this from coal or other bitumen, right? Um, pet coke, here we got some of that around. We start looking at that, the challenge is that we've got more carbon dioxide to, to deal with, and that multiplier is gonna be you know, much higher than 10. And so, so that's going to be the, the, uh, the, the issue that we have to deal with there. And, and sort of, I think, disadvantage that a little bit, even though the fuel, the input, right? Pet Coke might be awfully cheap. Yeah, okay. That, that's a great point. Well, and I think we have a question here as well, just around the economics of, of these uh, various um, methods, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, and you made it, of course, made a comment that all this stuff needs to be cost competitive, right? So, do you, can you make a comment on the economics of, of uh, production of various carbon intensities versus perhaps production from renewables, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I think the it's, it's pretty clear today, right? Right now, as it stands, that that I think electrolytic hydrogen is probably several times the production price of anything you're going to do from blue hydrogen. I didn't talk about the, the economics of it today because I didn't want to get into that. That's a whole separate topic, mm -hmm. I think, right? But um, it would be several times that from any of the blue hydrogen options I was discussing today, right? We might be, uh, and it's so hard to know, right, with the inflation that we're seeing and what costs might look like in the heartland, but let's say that's two, $2 a kilogram versus, you know, six, dollars a kilogram for like a little bit, just sort of ballpark numbers, right? So so the challenge, uh, so, so, you know, but the challenge that we have to deal with on the cost side is that the, the expectations for cost declines in electrolyzers is huge, right? We see gigafactories for electrolyzers being set up in Europe. So those, the costs will come down on that. I think the, the but those factories won't address intermittency of, of, um, of renewable inputs, right? That you need to have that really low carbon intensity. And if we start stepping back and saying, okay, well, we're gonna use those at low, uh, at low capacity factors, we have hydrogen storage, or, or we want at a higher capacity, we're gonna bring a grid, we're gonna mess up our, our carbon intensity. So right now, there's still a challenge, in my view, with the economics of, um, of um, renewable hydrogen from uh, electrolysis relative to fossil and blue hydrogen. But, um, you know, I think there, that, that we can't rest our laurels on that because mm -hmm. there are places like Australia that have both, right? right? Great solar potential and gas. So, and maybe they're closer to markets, right? So uh, I'm sure, you know, Mark, you're, you're out there yeah. <laughs> trying to make these sales, right? And, and some of this can be challenging. Yeah, for sure. Well, certainly, um, you know, as, as, you know, mentioned, I think that the, the low cost, we're well positioned with the low cost feedstock, the ability to produce, um, low cost blue hydrogen, the certification of the carbon intensity, I think will be certainly will be something that will add to the marketability of, of that coming out of Western Canada. I'm gonna to jump to another question here, Sean. Uh, question, I always get questions on why convert methane, natural gas to hydrogen for energy, if we can use it to generate electricity and still capture the CO2. Yeah, I, well, so, uh, the question is, do you want electricity or do you want a fuel, yeah. right? Um, so I think it's pretty clear that electricity um, has a lot of advantages, right? In terms of the end use efficiency, right? We know that uh, heat pumps, to the extent they work in the climates we're dealing with and, and or that we can afford the geothermal uh, ground source sort of setups that are needed are probably a lot better than burning hydrogen yeah. in our house, right, or gas. But, but we have all the infrastructure <laughs> to deliver hydrogen. If we all of a sudden want to charge EVs and run heat pumps on local distribution circuits in Calgary or Edmonton, can we do that? Yes, maybe. But you know, there, so there's just it's it's just not always as straightforward as the thermodynamics are going to tell you it is. But if the one if the desired output is electricity, going through all the process to make hydrogen yeah. just to make electricity, 
yes. if you can capture the CO2 off of a off the electricity production, then that would eliminate a lot of processing steps to go to hydrogen first. I think I think is sort of what the point here I, is. I agree with that, Mark. Yeah, I agree with that. And we've done some work right uh, here, a uh, student working uh, on on uh, use of hydrogen, hydrogen blending, and in, in, in gas turbines as well, right? Mm -hmm. And that just is not particularly efficient. Um, and you're just your fuel is yeah. so much more expensive. It yeah. just doesn't seem to make sense. So I agree. Right. Burn gas to make power, capture the CO2 there. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then without electricity, you can use it for other other decarbonization initiatives. So there's a few technical questions here. I don't I don't even follow the standards for publishing carbon intensity of hydrogen using the color method is not standardized or regulated. So which LCA modeling tools do you use other than GH Genius or the Greet model? I don't know what either of those. Yeah, are. yeah. So I don't think it's it, tools aren't important as important as the methods, right? That we that we agree upon to do this. And I, I so absolutely colors are just, you know, as I say, it's kind of a joke every time I go, I didn't mm -hmm. know about that color and that technology, but um, the we need to agree on, on the methods by which we're gonna evaluate the carbon intensity, right? And we can do that. If you look at the building products sector, for example, right? A lot of building products today are doing what they call environmental product declarations, EPDs. And those EPDs say, if you're going to buy uh, a composite decking material, here's the greenhouse gas intensity or the environmental impacts associated with a square meter of composite decking material, right? So they have uh, EPDs and then they have something called product category rules. And so the life cycle assessment community comes together, they agree on what's called a product category rule, which are the rules that allow people to make EPDs. And so you could see that there's ways, it's not necessarily, we, we like to think about, oh, well, is it GHG genius? Is it Greet? Is it, well, it's not so much the model that matters. Models are just the numbers you put into them. What matters is the, the agreement on the rules or, and the, okay. the, the approaches to doing it. And that isn't something to my understanding that, that we're really pursuing in terms of in the life cycle community anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, another technical question, have different capture methods amine versus solid sorbent been considered in this or any other recent LCA work? Mm -hmm. um, so there's been a lot of interest in, um, so, so I mean, we're, this, this study that I presented used MDEA, so in, in amine, right? Um, there is uh, the same, one of the studies, uh, I don't think I used it directly here, but um, um, by some of the co-authors on the paper that we did, they looked at uh, a VPSA, so it's solid sorbent based process um, to do this. And it, it was very similar. The, the, you know, the results, if you squint at them are very, very similar. Um, the, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, I saw a Q and A question about methane pyrolysis. So you've got, you've got a whole host, right? Pyrolysis, you've even got chemical, fixed bed chemical looping reforming, right? There's all kinds of technologies that are out there, partial oxidization based technologies right there could be commercially marketed. So there's a whole range of things. We've just looked at a couple, but there's a universe of potential process configurations. There are more and less technically mature that one could apply. And did you want to comment on methane paralysis since you mentioned it? I mean, there's a question here about, you know, mm -hmm. what, what what are maybe some of the challenges around that? Um, yeah, so so the results here are about, are about doing more conventional CCS, right? Mm -hmm. If we can come up and, and make these routes with uh, methane pyrolysis that get us to um, that get us to sort of solid carbon as a product, or as a it would be a waste, right? As a waste that we dispose of, I think that that I mean, there's a lot of promise in that. Certainly, it's simpler than CCS. We have to landfill it. We have to deal with the amounts we make there too. So it'll come with challenges, but certainly it's an interesting. It's technically very interesting, right? And something yeah. we've been pursuing for a long time. Yeah, my understanding is the mass balance, as you said, there'll be challenges. The mass balance is around the amount of carbon produced, right? Be, but again, maybe there's opportunities to deal with that. Um, I'm gonna keep going down the list here. Um, we have uh, six minutes left, so let's just keep using up our time. I think it makes this is some really good questions here, Sean. The U.S. bipartisan infrastructure deal defines clean hydrogen to mean hydrogen produced with a carbon intensity equal to or less than two kilograms of CO2 equivalent produced at the site of production per kilogram of hydrogen produced. How does Alberta use this nomenclature instead of the ridiculous colors that avoid a conversation on carbon intensity? 
to communicate with respect to the hydrogen economy. Yeah, so how are we using this nomenclature? I'm carbon intensity. In essence, this is what we're talking about, what has to happen here, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we need to, we need to um, advocate for and develop the, the use of these sorts of standardized rules around estimating that, right, for hydrogen products. Yeah. hydrogen as a product and and start using it i mean it's a good thing i think uh, i think heather campbell asking this question yes. i think it's great heather that 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 the the infrastructure deal actually had a number in it and i will say that the u.s at the federal level the the senate and house staff are very clever about the way they try to use life cycle um um sort of and and carbon intensity results in regulatory and regulation making. Of course, it goes both ways in terms of who's trying to use it how, but it's um, it's it's an, it's interesting. As you say, that's, I believe it, uh, it's at the site, right? So it's not the life cycle, right? It doesn't have anything to do with upstream. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's been some interesting conversations about, well, why isn't it life cycle? Why is it only at the site, right? And I've heard arguments, um, arguments on the two being, uh, used because people didn't want to talk about the upstream life cycle because yeah. in the U.S. there's so much uncertainty about that. Right. Yeah, certainly. I think those on your last slide or one of your last slides, you had the range, air bar range, but the amount of the the the, the methane emission intensity, I guess, from from some of, from the United States was such a wide range of uncertainty. So maybe, um, and I understand that your slide deck will be available, and so. Yes. Uh, participants can can have a look at that and have a revisit that last slide. I thought that was very interesting for sure. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, we've got three minutes left. I'm going to keep going here. When you state the greenhouse gas equivalent for electrolytic hydrogen, would it be correct to assume that you're using average grid intensity? So yeah, so we were, we, we were, using, we were using a European number in that particular study and that particular figure that I was showing you, and that was 420 kilograms per megawatt hour. Uh, so sort of natural gas fired combustion, roughly. So it would also be fair to think of electrolysis as a potential means of load balancing to deal with intermittency of renewables. In other words, hydrogen as a battery, I guess, is what this proposal is, this question is being asked here, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so hydrogen, um, yeah, so the, the integration, right? We haven't worked through, I, in my opinion, the integration across power and industry in Alberta, right? I think, Mark, you're probably seeing that on the, you know, the, 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 the mind face sort of on that, right? Mm -hmm. But we're trying to think about how do we integrate all these things together? I think it is true that you could be doing electrolysis uh, with, um, instead of shedding load or shedding actually a lot of uh, renewable generation, you could be using that to run electrolysis and store hydrogen, right? You could also store hydrogen by putting it up a hill or, or store water, excuse yeah. me, by popping yes. up a hill. So you have a yeah. lot of energy storage mechanisms that are in competition. The benefit in my mind of hydrogen storage is it, it potentially allows for very large energy storage over long seasons, right? So if we develop salt caverns as we have here in Alberta to store hydrogen, conceivably we could be putting electrolytic hydrogen into that when we have particularly sunny and windy periods and, and renewables that would otherwise be spilt and save it for that proverbial rainy day, which will come as we move to a system which becomes more and more decarbonized and has less and less sort of dispatchable traditional base load generation. Mm -hmm. And we have one minute. Can you make a comment on water? We didn't, there's a lot more questions. We won't be able to get to them all, but can you make a comment on water, like water requirements? And is that going to be a pinch point for the hydrogen economy? We haven't really talked about water yet. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, it will be. I mean, I think, so let me just make, like, generally speaking, life cycle assessments meant to think holistically and about trade-offs, right? And everybody's got the big focus on, on greenhouse gas emissions right now, right? And that makes sense in our net zero future, but we can't shoot ourselves in the foot while doing it. So yes, we do need to look more at water. We, there are, I'm pretty sure, some life cycle assessments out there that focus on water for hydrogen. I just, I'm not going to comment on them because I've been so focused on the carbon okay. side of it right now. Yeah. But, but they're out there. Okay. Well, we have brought us right to two o'clock. So I want to thank everybody who joined us. I want to thank Dr. McCoy for the presentation and the discussion. Very interesting. There's so many more questions remaining. Um, I might even suggest to the transition accelerator that it may be worth uh, scheduling another one because uh, lots of interest here. So 
Um, thank you very much, Dr. McCoy. Thanks to all the participants. Thanks to the Transition Accelerator for organizing. I think we'll say uh, we'll say goodbye to everybody now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.